Hello, what are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI, 124 Queen Street, Durban. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Gracious, the Merciful, I declare that there is no other object of worship but Allah, and I bear witness and testify that the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace be upon him, is his final messenger. I begin by greeting you on this second weekend of Ramadan with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu alaikum. Uh, by way of introduction this morning. I would just like to say a few words before handing over to Sheikh Ahmad Didat to conduct the classes to which you have responded here this morning. The classes that we are going to conduct, uh, I'd just like to clarify for you so you don't have any misconception. As you are aware, most of you, I presume, are residents of Durban with uh, Sheikh Didat's reputation and his <coughs> lifelong work. He's a scholar in comparative religion with particular expertise on the Christian doctrines. And when we speak of comparative religion, it ideally means that we are supposed to give you a comparison of the different religions, their ideologies, their beliefs, etc. The class that we have got this morning is a very specialized course and it is not a course on comparative religion per se. That does not mean that elements of it cannot be used. The class as advertised is for a very specific purpose. The class that you are that you have attending this morning or the knowledge you are going to get is for a very specific purpose and as the advert said to arm yourselves. To arm yourselves because in our community that we live in we are uh, of late been getting numerous complaints from members of our community, members of the public that our community, the Muslim community, the Hindu community and even members in the black community are being harassed by the missionary activities of people knocking at the doors. There is no harm, we believe, from us putting our point of view across and listening to other points of views. But for those of you who have had the experience of having people calling at your door, you will find that it is not a case of people coming to ask and exchange ideas in a respectful way. We are actually being harassed. Now, I'd just like to find out before I continue any further, is there anybody in this room that has not had the experience of having a missionary coming and knocking at their door, peddling their ways, trying to sell you the ideology. Is there anybody in this room who has not had that experience? So I can see from the fact that nobody's putting up their hands, you'll all know what I'm talking about. I don't think that we object, we must be very clear on this, of listening to somebody else's point of view. It's Islamic for us. But I think that we must take steps when we are being harassed at our own doorsteps. Now the course this morning, Mr. Didat, by way of methodology, is going to give you a little bit of a shock treatment He's actually going to give you a sledgehammer. 
We don't have hours and hours and days and days to teach you all the ideologies of the different religions, etc., etc., uh, because there are different forums for different things. Now, I can liken it by way of analogy to having a shock treatment when you have a heart attack. You know, when you're having treatment, if you're not well with heart, the doctor prescribes certain tablets for you, he may keep you in observation, etc. But when you have a heart attack, the surgeon on hand has to take very drastic action to get your heart going again. He'd have to sometimes inject you directly in the heart, or as most of us have seen on television, they bring those electrodes and shock you back so you can get things done. So, Mr. Didat today, by way of explanation, is going to show you how you can arm yourself with the knowledge that you will get in this two-hour session. I'm not going to ask you to sit back and enjoy a lecture because it's not a lecture, it's going to be a working session. You will work for two hours and you will be given uh, methodology and methods where you could directly use, use it to be able to overcome this threat that comes through to our door. Now, I'm reminded of a, of a story that took place at the time of our prophet when he was reputedly uh, taking a rest, uh, uh, taking a bit of a rest under a tree and an unbeliever went up to him, drew his sword and stuck it through to him and said, now, O Muhammad, who is going to save you now? And the Prophet, without blinking, before the person knew how it happened, suddenly was able to rest the sword and turned it to the person and said, well, now tell me who's going to save you. Allah has saved me, who is going to save you? So likewise, the, what you are going to get today is not from a Quranic point of view how to tackle certain things, the very ideology that is being brought through to your door and is being given through to you, Mr. Didat will show you today in two hours and you will be amazed at the end of this. I don't know how many of you have paid for this course. If you're not happy, you can get a refund. That's how confident I am that you will get it. He will show you how you'll be able to take this and, and turn it back to your advantage. So that's, I wanted to just clarify and explain so that when you go away from here, you knew exactly what you've come in for so that there is no misgivings when you've gone away saying that I thought Mr. Didat was a scholar of comparative religion, he is, but the course that I got, I really thought it was going to be, he's going to tell us about the different religions, etc. No, it is a short, intensive, very intensive two-hour course. There will be a little bit of homework for you after you go away for life. If you want to continue it, I urge you to continue it. But what you'll be given, you'll be armed with a sledgehammer where I know that the people we've had on this course, I've got a letter upstairs from a group of people that came in here from an Islamic organization who have written as a group and said that they are now actually looking forward to the missionary to come to the, the door. They're they actually now ready because for the first time they are armed. I have taken six minutes of your time. I want to thank you for giving off your time on a busy Saturday morning in Ramadan. And I also want to thank Sheikh Didat uh, as president of the IPCI at his age. He has people doing the work for him. He doesn't need to come in on a Saturday morning, but to come out all the way from Verlam to come and share his knowledge with us, we really appreciate it. So I look forward uh, to us receiving this knowledge, and I'm sure everybody will find it beneficial. Jazakallah, shukran. I call upon Mr. Didat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنحون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله ولو آمن أحل الكتاب لكان خير لهم منهم المؤمنون وأكثرهم الفاسقون صدق الله صدق الله نور العزيم ما يدعون Brothers and sisters, I read to you an ayah, a verse from the Holy Quran from Surah Ali Imran. Ali Imran happens to be chapter 3. And ayah number 110. In it, Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrajat linnas, that you are the best of people evolved for mankind. Because you enjoin what is right and you forbid what is wrong. And you believe in Allah. As soon as this honor, this privilege, this high state is given to us, a certain responsibility is imposed upon us. 
no honor without responsibility. And the responsibility is, Allah continues in that ayah, the same verse, so, but if the people of the book, who are the people of the book? Jews and Christians. But if the people of the book, but if the people of the book, they hearken to this message, they listen to this message, they accept this message, it will be better for them. In others, it will be better for you. Among them, there are good people, mu'mins. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. Now, this verse is so versatile, is so adaptable, that one can deliver half a dozen, I can ha deliver half a dozen different lectures just on this verse. I have tried it, half a dozen different lectures. I can, I have heard people quoting the ayah and delivering a lecture, something quite different. Next person, again, you hear the same ayah and delivering another lecture, entirely different. It's a very versatile, adaptable verse. But now, six lectures just on that. I'm, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a learned man, not an alim, but I can give you six lectures on that. Have you got the time for that? No. I am going to pick up the last phrase of that, of this ayah. Minhumul mu'minuna among them, among the Jews and the Christians, there are good people and the majority of them are perverted transgressors. The good people, if you want to deal with them, in this booklet I have given you, just opened out the packet. The good people from among the Jews and the Christians, you can expound to them what the Bible says about Muhammad, read it, study it, share with them. You can expound to them, share with them Muhammad the natural successor to Christ. You can share and expound Muhammad the greatest. These are for the goodly people. The straightforward, sincere people. The mu'min among them. But Allah says, but the majority of them are perverted transgressors. For the majority of them, I have this one book here. Combat Kit. So we are going to specialize on this Fasik, perverted transgressors among the Jews and the Christians who are coming and knocking at our doors. Now, this book came about as a result of my visit to the Sudan, just around last year in June or so. I was in the Sudan. And after my lectures, every lecture is followed by questions and answers. At question time, a university student is posing the question. He said, Mr. Didat, the Christians are coming from Britain, from America, into the Sudan and they come and knock at our doors in Khartoum, in the capital. And we, probably all Arabs, the best words of welcome that in any language you can find, they say Ahlan wa Sahlan, family and plain. Just think you're a member of the family and be at ease. And they settle down and they pose the question. They are asking us questions. So you believe in the day of judgment? This is the latest now. You believe in the day of judgment? The Muslim says yes, you believe in the day of judgment. So after judgment is established, if you deserve heaven, you'll get it. If you deserve hell, you'll get it. You believe in that? You say, yes, yes, we believe in that. Now this heaven of yours, where will it be? Will it be here on this earth or in the skies? What does your Quran say? Whatever you say, on earth, you say, show me. If you say it will be in the skies, you say, show me. And he knows for a fact that the bulk of the Muslims, 99% of us, will not be able to. We, at the back of the mind, we have some ideas. This topic didn't worry us. Wallah, it didn't worry me. I said, look, where the heaven will be, whether it's in the skies or on earth, wherever, if I deserve heaven, I'll get it. If I deserve hell, I'll get it. That I believe. But it didn't bother me to find out where so now, the, the, the person is asking me, Mr. D. Dad, what is the answer? What is the answer? I said, at the back of my mind, I have my prejudices, my preform ideas. But the guy wants to know, what does your Quran say? So when you say Quran says this, show me, and he knows you won't be able to show. Now, this is his strategy of opening his Bible to you. You see, he gave you the first chance. Show me what your Quran says. 
He says, just teach me, expand to me. And he knows that you won't be able to do that. Then he said, look, I will show you what my Bible says. Now you are duty bound. Out of courtesy, you are duty bound to listen to him. You are like a sitting duck now. See, because he gave you the first chance, you failed. So he said, now I'll show you what my Bible says. He's got you. So Mr. Didar, what's the answer? So I had to confess to my audience, and I confess to you even now, that I'm a born Muslim. I'll confess to the Christian missionary. He said, look, I'm a born Muslim, 75 years old. And in the eyes of the people, I'm a very knowledgeable fellow. In the eyes of the people, you know, who come to listen to me, they say, hey, Mr. Didat must be an alim, an allama, without the title. See, he's a great lecturer, professor, they, they call me, at times they call me doctor, ustaz, uh, and all kinds of maulana. All these titles have been thrown at me. So, in the eyes of the people, I'm a knowledgeable fellow. And I don't know. I'm ashamed of myself. Having confessed, I said, now we must turn the tables. So, I said, I suggest to the guy, I said, look, I don't know my Quran as I ought to know. But I take it, you know your Bible. And he's too arrogant to say no. He's got one under his arm. That's why he's there in your house. He wants to present the Bible to you. He wants to expand the Bible to you. She said, of course. He says, can I have a look? Ready, ready, ready. He's, he's ready. That's what he wants. He wants you to accept his Bible. So he gives you the Bible. He said, when he gives me the Bible, I open the Bible. Genesis chapter 19, verse 30. And I give it back to him. I said, read. You read. He's going to glance at it. He's trained not to respond to your commands. You say, read. Not like this. I read Surah Fatiha. He said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Mm -hmm. That guy is too clever for that. When you say, read, he's going to glance. And when he glances, he smells a rat. <laughs> he smells a rat there. He wants to change the subject. So I said, what? what's wrong? Isn't that the word of God? He said, yes. I said, I want to hear you read. And if he reads, what will he read? You open now your book, page 13, of Combat Kit, page 13. Page 13 of Combat Kit. Got it? Page 13. It tells you under 16, the heading is incest. Incest. Very strong word that. I don't know if you know the meaning of the word incest. You see, sexual relationship between two individuals who are not married is adultery. Zina. Which in the house of Islam is next to murder. Incest is worse than that. Sexual relationship between two persons who are so closely related, like between father and daughter, like between son and his mother, like between father-in-law and daughter-in-law, like between brother and sister. Shh. It is the most despicable thing. It has become endemic in America. Fathers molesting their own daughters. Here, in the Eddington Hospital, in the researches they have done, they said 8% of all white children who get molested are by their own fathers. And the 4-year-old and 5-year-old and 14-year-old. 8% of all all child molestation cases that take place is between the own father, not stepfathers, and not relations, but bone father. Eight percent in America it has become endemic, like an epidemic. But now we have to deal with this topic because we want to turn the tables. This is a kind of inoculation I'm giving you. This is not a pleasant topic to discuss, more especially with my sisters and my daughters here. It's not pleasant. Wallah is not pleasant. But it has to be done. Somebody has to dirty his hand. Somebody has to dirty his mouth. It's not pleasant. I'd rather talk about the Quran, about this, that, 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 about this beautiful comparative religion, you know. It says, what is Taurat? What is Zabur? What is Injil? What is Furqan? Oh, beautiful. I, lo I love to talk that. But now, this is an inoculation I'm giving you. 
and inoculation you going if you are going overseas you go for a vaccination and you go for cholera very painful cholera is very painful I don't know if any of you have experienced it you know they give you a jab and it's quite painful after a couple of days you know the thing gets swollen and you might develop even a fever what is an inoculation they love to hurt you they cost you about three three rounds or something or I don't know <laughs> and they charge you many previously just to do it for nothing now they charge you three rounds and they give you an injection and give you a sore arm why they want to introduce into your system an agent of a disease cholera that your body in a little amount minute amount so that your body might get geared up into giving battle to that bacteria that agent and once it has overcome because this is a minute quantity your body has developed those fighting mechanisms inside that when actually the cholera germs invade your body the body is already geared to do boxing to those germs and conquer it that's that's the secret of an inoculation the purpose behind an inoculation now I'm giving an inoculation it's also painful but this is now to immunize you against the Christian missionary so we're dealing with the harshest the strongest of topics there's so much this little booklet here can keep you busy for months months this this is an index of what how you're going to use this with the Bible but now the first item between father and daughters a a uh, Imran read it read it loud let everybody hear a a that night they both the daughters of Lot gave him their father Lot wine to drink and the older daughter had intercourse with him the next day the older daughter said to her sister I slept with him last night now let's get him drunk again tonight and you sleep with him then each of us will have a child by our father so that night they got him drunk and the younger daughter had intercourse with him in this way both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father now this is what you're reading is the Holy Bible this is the Holy Bible of the Jews and the Christians I'm asking what's holy about that daughters seducing the father getting him drunk and having sex with the father and thus becoming pregnant and both the daughters of Lot were a child by the father what's holy about that so we are asking what is the moral to the Christian if he read it he said what is the moral of this story what is the lesson to be learned see every tale we tell our children fables fairy tales we tell our children anecdotes about the fox and the grapes the wolf and the lamb the dog and the shadow you heard all this as children you hear this you know no fox ever jumped for grapes do you know that the fox don't jump for grapes but it's just a story invented we said the fox was jumping trying to get at the grapes and can't reach it can't reach it tried again and again and it's fed up it can't reach the grapes so it says sour grapes so we are trying to tell our children don't be like that greedy fox when you can't get a thing he says sour grapes don't be like that the wolf and the lamb or the dog in the shadow a dog finds a bone with the bone in his mouth is crossing a wooden bridge and he sees the reflection in the water he's thinking there's another dog with a bone in his mouth he's greedy for the other dog's bone so he's a boom so you lost what he had don't you be like that my child what Allah has given you appreciate it don't be greedy for the other dog's bones it's a moral it's a moral it's a lesson to be learned every story that you tell there is a moral behind it otherwise it's a waste of time Dr. Vernon Jones an American psychologist of great repute he carried out experiments on groups of school children to whom certain stories were being read to a standard two group for example you tell them about St. George this St. George this young boy St. George he sees a dragon and he goes and finds a sword and he goes and slays the dragon he kills it the same St. George he sees a python and he's looking for something to to confront it with and he couldn't find anything so he picks up a stone and smashes on the head and kills it another group of also standard two children you tell them the same St. George but this St. George saw a dragon and he got so terrified and he ran scooted to his mother and he cried in her lap the same St. George he saw the snake 
and how he climbed up the tree and he started howling like a wolf. In actual life, these children, when they really are confronted with problems, this is how their minds will work. That group that was told, confrontation, is going to start thinking, how? How am I going to overcome this? The other one is how to run to my mother. <laughs> Let in actual life, is that these stories made certain slight but permanent changes in character, even in the narrow classroom situation, in little, little things, little, little things. They behave like that. You keep on telling your child, there's a ghost out there, jin shape, jin shape. Your child will be too terrified to go out and that, uh, in the evening to go and buy some cold drink for you. For you. <laughs> so, there might be something there. <laughs> the other children, you don't talk about these things, they have all this right, go and bring a bottle of cold drink, so just rush it along and bring it. The other one is like a jin hoga, bhut hoga. It depends upon how you program your children. So you program your children with this. It must have certain slight but permanent changes in character. And we can see it's happening. It's happening, practical experience. Researchers are showing us that it's happening wholesale. So now, this. We have given you a Bible. You open up the first book of the Bible, Genesis. First book of the Bible, Genesis. But I don't want you to start fumbling for, look, try and find pages 14 and 15. Pages 14 and 15, just at the very beginning. Pages 14 and 15, at the very beginning. Pages 14 and 15. Can't be very far. Pages 14 and 15. 14 and 15. Found them? Everybody? 14, 15. Right now, with the red pens that are given to you, red pens you'll find inside the tube, inside the box, yeah, red pen. Take them out. And right across, between page 14 and 15, right, right across, have a look at this, incest between father and daughters. Oh. Incest between father and daughters. Just write across and underline it. Incest, don't be afraid to mutilate that book. This is yours, the book is yours. For taking away. So don't spare the book. It's my book, I have given it to you. Don't spare the book. Don't feel pity for the book. Right, right across, incest between father and daughters. Having done that, I said, you see, this booklet, this booklet on page 13, you write there about what the young man read, about Lot and his two daughters, page 13, what he read, right on the side, on the side, P14, where the reference is, about the incest between father and daughters, write down P15, I'm sorry, P15, here on the side here, of the book, write P15, means page 15, in your Bible. Because everybody has got the same Bible, you can afford to put down these numbers. That you don't have to start fumbling. Where's Genesis chapter 19? Verse 30. You just say P15. Write it here. Here. On the side. That's right. Just P15. That's right. Here. Write in your book. That's right. That's right. P15. Now this booklet is an invaluable aid, support in your battle. And after you glance through it, you read it you are likely to put it with the other books in your library. And it's apt to get lost. When the enemy comes to your door, he knocks at the door, you know the size, where is it? You start fumbling for it, and you might not find it. Or somebody comes along to the house, it's a combat kit. This is a very, very, very a strong topic, man, combat kit. Bible thumpers, Christians like, hmm? Is it, can I borrow this, sister? Can you say no? Can you say no? Sir, can I borrow this? You know, I'll read it and give it back to you. Finish. It's gone. 
Now when the enemy comes to your door, <laughs> you're helpless. That license revolver you had, you give it to somebody else. It's a license revolver, give it away. So what you do now, you have this book affixed in your Bible in the front inside cover, you glue it, the glue is given to you. You glue the book like this, see how it's done? Glue it there, that it doesn't get lost. If you lose, you lose the whole encyclopedia, the Bible. So whoever gets it, he gets everything. Glue it, the glue is also provided. You apply the glue to the back of the book, and then you stick it on. Apply the glue, yes, to the cover itself or to the back of the book. Yeah, oh. He who goes a borrowing goes a sorrowing. Don't spare the glue. Don't spare the glue. You know, use it liberally so it doesn't come off. Is they permanently fixed? Lose the book, lose the whole, whole Bible. That's it. That's it. That's it. Inshallah, the glue is also good. It's his high quality stuff, you know. <laughs> now, on the opposite of this book, on the top, put your name and address. Make it personally your own copy. When you grow old like Ahmad Didat, then you can say, hey, Mr. Didat, you know, he gave us a lecture, whether you liked it or not. But this is the book that he gave us, whether you like it or not. Make it personally your own copy. Remembering this morning, Saturday the 6th of March, 1993. Your name and your address. That makes personally your own copy. The booklets are yours to take away, as well as the Bible. The only thing you leave behind is the red pen and the tube that you leave behind for future classes. Now, at the bottom of page 14 and 15, open again, page 14 and 15, open again, page 14 and 15. At the bottom, see here, at the bottom, write incest between mother and son. A nice bold handwriting, right across, from one end to the other. Incest between mother and son. Beta or ma? Ma beta. And put down P32 in page 32. P32 means page 32. So you don't have to start fumbling for chapters, 35, 35. You're looking for 35 and you've gone into Exodus and you're looking for still 35 and you find it is not what you're looking for. P 32, P 32,
P32. Found it? Page 32. Everybody got it? Page 32. Right on the top, just like this. Incest between mother and son. Incest between mother and son. Page 32, pen, page 32. Incest between mother and son. And circle verse 22. On page 32, you find there verse 22. Look at this here, circle it like that. Circle it like that. Circle it. Page verse 22, circle it. Page 32. Verse 22. Circle it. And at home when you have a, a highlighter, you can highlight it. You can highlight what you have written also. Make it a nice color-coded Bible. Attractive. Attractive instrument to use. Circle it. Verse 22. We have missed out on page 15 something. On page 15 we missed out. Go back to page 15. Go back to page 15. Page 15, go back to page 15 and circle, outline this. Verse 30, see that verse 30 to 30, 36. 30 to 36, circle that. 30 to 36, circle that. 30 to 36. This is the whole story of Lot and his two daughters. Circle that. Verse 30 to 36. And if you have a highlighter, highlight it at home. You know, make it look nice and brilliant. And underline some of those important words. Underline them. At home. And take the trouble. Find a little time, spare time. Just go over the whole chapter. At home. So you have the whole mental picture of what is going on, what is going on. As so we have a mental picture of those verses. So guys, what's the context? Is the context it is it's, it says itself that the father and the daughters are in a cave, has a blue talisara. and in the cave the eldest daughter has an idea, brainwave, that look, our father is old, and there's not another man on earth who can come in and to us in the manner of all the earth means what human beings do. There's not another guy to do it to us. So come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him. This is the, this Bible language. The modern version says, and have intercourse with him. See, we have quoted that. The one that was read was, 
from the new modern translation. They call a spade a spade. Here, they're using flowery language. We will lie with him, maybe to make him warm, hmm? that we may preserve the seed of our father, preserve the seed of our father, babka bij, bachayenge, to have child by our father, have to preserve the seed of our father. So the eldest daughter does it. Then the next night she tells the youngest, look, we, I did it last night, you go and do this tonight also. So they make the father drink once more, get him drunk, and the younger daughter goes and sleeps with the father. And thus, just like that, both the daughters of Lord will be child by the father. Incest, children of incest. And they are a blessed people in the Bible. The children of Lot, through his daughters, are a blessed people. When the Jews went out into Egypt, I'm sorry, into, into Palestine, out of Egypt, they were commanded by God to kill the Palestinians, men, women, and children. Nothing was to, to be spared, not even sucklings, little babies in the mother's arms. Kill them all. Nothing that breeds must live. Even donkeys were not spared. So, but the Ammonites and the Moabites thou shalt not touch. Don't disturb them. Don't harass them because they are the children of Lord through his daughters. Father and daughters having sex, producing bastard children. They are blessed in the Bible. So what's the moral? The Palestinians kill them. Even sucklings are not to be spared. But the Ammonites and the Moabites, each daughter had an Ammon and Moab. They became the Ammonites and the Moabite two tribes. And these tribes are not to be touched. Don't disturb them. Because they are the children of Lord to his daughters. What's the moral? I said, what's the moral? If there's no moral, it's immoral. If there's no moral behind a the story, then it's immoral. It's a waste of time and filth and dirt. In a book of God, pornography. <laughs> when I was young, I was looking for the Arabian Nights and the unexpurgated edition. I read it. I didn't know for two and six. This Bible was available for two and six. I could have got all that and I could have, um, you know, with prestige, so I'm reading the Bible. I'll be reading all the pornography that is in here. All the pornography. George Bernard Shaw, the British playwright, he said, the most dangerous book on earth, keep it under lock and key, this book, is, is not to be allowed to get into the hands of your children. But they want to push it down your throat. Hmm? They come into your they want to push it down your throat. Because you don't know. And they're catching fish. The Christians are catching fish with this. They have perverted. I think, look, let them, best thing is next Saturday. Next Saturday for them. Because it's, you can't, you can never catch up. You can never catch up. Next Saturday, 10 o'clock. But be, be a little before 10. Because you can never catch up. Am I right? You can never catch up now. You have to wait for two persons. No, it's not fair. It's not fair to anybody. <laughs> so George Bernard shows the most dangerous book on earth. Keep it under lock and key. The Plain Truth magazine, Christian magazine, he says, a many a censor will give it an X rating. It's not fit for children. And you'll see why as we proceed. This is father and daughters. Then son and his mother. Read it, somebody. Verse 22. Read it. Read it. Verse 22. One of my sisters. Read it, sister. You know, like it came to pass, like once upon a time. Uh -huh. Like telling you a story now. Yes, once upon a time. It came to pass. Who is Israel? Yaakub alayhi salam. See, his title was changed to Israel, the soldier of God. Yaakub alayhi salam. He had 12 sons. And they became 12 tribes. The Bani Israel, the children of Israel. Israel is Yaakub. Hazrat Yaakub alayhi salam. Yes, when Israel dwelt in the land. Right. Uh-huh. Right, mashallah. Right. So Reuben, his eldest son, eldest son of Yaqub Salam, he goes and sleeps with his mother, his father's wife. What is your father's wife to you? Mother. Your mother. Your father's wife is your mother. Whether you call her stepmother or what, she is still your mother. So this guy, the eldest son of Yaqub Salam, he goes and has sex with this, intercourse with this mother. And Israel heard it. You know, they told him, he said, look, your son, <laughs> he enjoyed your wife. <laughs> and the guy, he didn't even get angry, he didn't even spit. You know, he says, you, you know what man normally does. When you hear a thing like that, my son doing that to me, 
you know, I'll blow my top. Even if I'm old and discrepit, I, I can't even punch or slap him. But my tongue, you know, what I'm going to say, you know. <laughs> my blood pressure will go up. My heartbeat will go up. But Israel heard it. Nice, girl. Huh? This is what your elder son did it to your, to your wife, to his mother. And he heard it. Sunlia. Finish. Finish. Yes. The terminology concubine used over here. Yes, yes. Is yes. a little misleading. Right. One associates with just a, a, a free associating woman. Right. And here the question of uh, mother in law. Right. Was, was this concubine his wife? Right. Right. You see, Jews, they have played fast and loose. Like Bibi Hajra. They say Sarah was his wife and Hajra was his concubine. I mean, a woman that he has kept. So did your religion allow you that? No, no. If, if it did, because uh, Hazrat Ibrahim he couldn't be committing adultery with another woman. Hazrat Suleiman in the Bible, he said he had 700 wives and 300 concubines with whom he had sex with all. So was he committing adultery with those 300? Could he be? No. No. This was allowed in the system, so now this is they call second grade of wife. But in the Holy Bible, you'll find in this reference that I have given you, you'll find Ketura. Ketura, look for K now. Uh, in the index, see in the index, in the index, look for Ketura, K, Ketura. In the index, right at the, right at the beginning of this booklet, Right, it says page 23, Ketura, K-E-T-U-R-A-H, Ketura, page 23. Now you see, by asking questions, you're getting something. Otherwise, you wouldn't have got this. I mean, I would have left it to you in your own spare time. If you had the chance, you would have come. Ketura, page 23. Got it? Ketura. Right, the first reference is that then again, Abraham took a wife. And her name was Ketura. That's the third wife of Ibrahim Ali Salam. He had Sarah, he had Hajra, and now Ketura. Read that. Then it says here, Ketura being the wife of Abraham. This is in the Bible. Genesis chapter 25 verse 1. Supposed to be written by Moses. This is supposed to be the Torah. In which it says, Ketura is the wife of Abraham. His third wife. Ketura being the wife of Abraham is being contradicted. In the sa same, self-same word of God, that is the Bible. In 1 Chronicles chapter 32, uh, chapter, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 1 verse 32, where Keturah is described as uh, Abraham's concubine. Right? So Musa alayhi salam said he was his wife. And whoever wrote the book of Chronicles in the Bible, same Bible, he, said he was his concubine. So if concubine and and wife does not mean the same thing. There's another contradiction in the Bible. What was she? Was she his wife or concubine? If it means the same thing, you say, look, concubine means the same thing, and wife means the same thing, then there's no problem. Otherwise, there is an extra contradiction in the Bible, because one man, inspired by God, Musa alayhi salam, he said he was his wife. And that guy, an unknown writer, the book of Chronicles is an unknown author. He said he was, she was his concubine. Is that a contradiction? If it is, then this is not the book of God. Another proof is not the book of God. <laughs> Otherwise, we have to admit that wife and concubine mean one and the same thing. Right? Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines with whom he could have had intercourse. Was he committing adultery with 300? Suleiman alayhi salam. Dawud alayhi salam. Every prophet of God had more than one wife. The second wife, if she's a concubine, he's committing adultery. No. So that's his wife. It's just a type of label that you want to apply. Take a londi, hey londi, a rakihui, hey, whatever. Is she his wife? Was it legal? Sexual relationship between the two? Was it legal? In the sight of God and the sight of the, of the Bani Israel? He said, yes, it was legal. So, his wife, she is his wife. Concubine and wife mean one and the same thing. Right. Get back to page 32. Page 32. Back to page 32 in your Bible. And at the bottom right, in bold handwriting, right through across the two pages, incest 
between father-in-law and daughter-in-law. Incest between father. This is a specialist, specialized book on incest. If you want to know the types and types of incest that exist, you'll find it in the Holy Bible. And they say Muhammad copied the Quran from the Bible. There's not one of these things I find in the Quran. Incest between father-in-law and daughter-in-law. Right in big writing across. Father-in-law and daughter-in-law right at the bottom. Incest between father-in-law and daughter-in-law. And write down P35. I mean page 35. So easy reference, you see, instead of looking for chapters and verses, chapters and verses, easy reference. Page 35. Page 35. Page 35. Page 35. Page 35. Page 35. And verse 15. Verse 15. Start reading. You, brother. Yes, you read loudly. Verse 15 on page 35. Read, read, read. Read, I said, read. Verse 15, page 35, man, please. You can't find page 35. How are you going to give battle to the Nasara? Huh? Okay. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot because she had covered her face. Verse 16. Now carry on, yes. And he turned unto her, by the way, and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. Read on. And she said, What wilt thou give me? Thou mayest come into unto me. And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me a pledge till thou send it? And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in mine hand. In thine hand. In thine hand. Ha -ha. And he gave it to her and came unto her, uh -huh. and she conceived by him. Right, now you've got the whole picture. You see, the story is chapter 38. At home you're going to read it. That now, you circle these verses 15 to 18. Just circle them like this here. Just circle them in red. 15 to 18, circle them. Circle them. 15 to 18, just circle them. And you can have an arrow coming down from the shh. Right? Arrow coming down from the top. Shh. 15 to 18, circle the verses. And she conceived. Father in law and daughter in law now. They have sex by the roadside. And she conceived, I means she became pregnant. And you read further, when you read further, it will tell you that in three months time, Naturally, if a woman is pregnant, it becomes apparent three months' time. And she's getting twins is more apparent, getting two. So the abdomen will be double the size. 
So the old man gets the news. Now the story is chapter 38. You must read the whole chapter. Very interesting. You don't have to look for Arabian Nights, the unexpurgated edition. You have it in your house now. The Arabian Nights. You read it. Read it. It's nice to know in this book of God, the holy book, what's holy about that. So it starts, chapter 38 starts, that Judah, the father of the Jewish race, from whom we get the word Judaism, Judea, Huda, Judah is Huda, Yahudi, all the words come from this word Judah, one of the sons of Yaakov al -Islam. He had three sons, Er, Onan and Shelah, that's what you will read in chapter 38. And Er was big enough to get married, so the old man gets her daughter-in-law by the name of Tamar. But something Er does, the Bible doesn't say what, which God didn't like, so God killed him. So what's the lesson? You do anything that God doesn't like, he can punish you, he can destroy you. That's a moral. Then the old man, according to Jewish custom, he said, look, if one brother dies, leaves no offspring, then his name will perish. No more. That name, Didat, is no more. So now the second brother takes the, his widow to wife. He has sex with her, doesn't get married, no nikah ceremony performed, but as a duty, religious duty. So he tells his second son, Onan, he says, you go in and do your brother's wife and beget child by her, so the name of the deceased can carry on. Uska naam mit jave. His name does not perish. Otherwise, no more that uh, earth's name will be finished from this earth. No more children left. So according to that, Onan, he goes into his brother's wife. And at the most critical juncture, he spills his seed on the ground. So God kills him also. It's called onanism. In the dictionary, the Oxford dictionary, you'll find the word onanism. Technically, it's called coitus interruptus. But God kills him also. Why? Because he was supposed to do a certain job of work, which he didn't do. Heartily, he should have done it. But he spills his seed on the ground, so God kills him also. So now the old man tells his daughter-in-law, he said, look, you go and stay at your father's house until the third fellow is grown. And when he's big enough, I will call you, so he can perform his duty. But the old man, conveniently, he forgot. Conveniently, it suited him, because he had lost two sons, account of this witch. This woman is a witch. You know, old people, this, this is a witch. Do bera bitako kage. He had two of my sons, this woman here. <laughs> so he says, the third fellow might also go, same way. So conveniently, he forgot, and the third fellow is grown up, and he gets him married. And that woman is grating. So she says, I want to take revenge on this father-in-law of mine. So she gets the news that her father-in-law was going to Timnat, don't worry about the name, to share his sheep. So she says, right, I'll fix up the old man, the rascal. Yeah? So he, she goes and sits by the roadside, on the road, to Timnat, and the old man is game. He sees this woman sitting by the roadside, say, allow me to come in unto thee. Let me have sex with you. So she says, what will you give me? He says, I'll give you a goat kid. He says, what guarantees that I will give it? You have sex, you enjoy yourself, and you go away, and you might not send the goat kid. What guarantee is there? So what guarantee do you want? He says, your signet, your ring, and your bracelet, these two were bangles those days. And your banger, and your star, Asa, of Musa al -Islam. So the old man gave it to her, and he had sex with his daughter-in-law. And she became pregnant straight away. The two sons failed. This old man, one hit, twins, twins, two, two at a time. And three months time, he gets the news that your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. She's a whore. She's a bitch. You know, she's carrying a baby by whoredom. She says, bring her, bring her, we'll burn her, the bitch. The old man can confront her with the servant she sends these things. He says, please go and ask my father-in-law. I beg you to find out from me to whom these things belong. Because the guy who's this ring and this bracelet and the staff, he is the guy responsible for my condition. So please find out who can that person be. So the old man says, this is mine, man. <laughs> She's better than me. And the Bible says he had no more intercourse with her. Only one intercourse he had. Now, nine months have gone. And the nurse is waiting because they are twins. And the Jews are very jealous to find out which one came out first. Because if they are identical twins, and once they are both out, and if they get mixed up, you can be doing injustice. Because the firstborn, the first one who sees the light of day, gets all the inheritance. Not like in Islam, everybody gets equal. No, no, no. The first one gets everything. So now you can be doing injustice if they are identical twins. Which one came out first? So she's waiting, waiting. And the first one puts out his hand from his mother's womb. 
So quickly, quickly, she pulls the scarlet thread, ties him up, and it's too sensitive, so the guy pulls it back inside. Then the other one comes out. So she calls his name Fares. Fares in Hebrew means the guy who breaks the queue, who pushes others aside. Because it was the other guy's turn. He had put his hand out first. I'm first. But the other one now came out. So you, you broke the queue. So her name is Fares. Then came out his brother with the scarlet thread. So they call him Zara. Zara in Hebrew means red because he had the scarlet thread. And these Fares and Zara are the great grandfathers of your God, Jesus Christ. According to your Gospels of Matthew in the genealogy, these are the great grandfathers of your God, Jesus. Children of incest are the great grandfathers of your God, Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, And this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Phares and Zara of Tamar, father-in-law and daughter-in-law, produces two bastard children. They are the great grandfathers of your God, Jesus. What's the moral of that? What's the moral of that? Huh? That's the most important thing, man. You know, your God, will we be happy? You tell him, you say, you know, your great grandfather. In the genealogy as they have given us, according, there are six bastards and begetters of bastards of Jesus, his ancestors. No, this is strong words. I say, look, this is so. There are six bastards and begetters of bastards in this book for Jesus, his ancestors. A man who had no ancestor, who had no genealogy, they give him 66 fathers and grandfathers, out of whom six are bastards and bigoters of bastards. You think Jesus will be very happy? Huh? With this genealogy, he said, look, <laughs> my God, my Lord, this is your ancestry. Huh? Six bastards and bigoters of bastards. To a man who had no father. Now with that book, with that crap, they are getting converts, my sisters and my brothers. With this rubbish. They are getting converts. And you and I, we can't get converts with the Quran. You and I, we are not. Some of the converts we get is our daughters are bringing them in. Wallah, in South Africa especially. It's not the Mulvis, it's not the Molanas, not the Didats. Actually, our daughters are bringing them in. Father comes along, he says, now he says, uh, my daughter, she has run away with this guy here. And now somehow we persuaded him to accept Islam. <laughs> Please, you know, convert him. Willy-nilly. Have him converted. Nose is cut, not cut guy. My daughter ran away, carrying his baby. Now, with Mr. Moodley. Naam ka Musulman Banado, even by name. We can call him Mr. Muhammad Moodley. My son-in-law, Mr. Muhammad Moodley. Oh, or Mr. Dawood Governor. You know, the nose is cut, now plastic surgery. Who's doing the conversions? Our daughters. And that's a fact, not men, not the tablighi jamaat. The men are doing nothing, is our daughters are doing the job. What a disgraceful, what a shameful thing to confess, to admit that is our daughters are doing the job. The men are emasculated, castrated, the men are castrated. You do nothing, is your daughters are doing the job. With this rubbish, with that crap, that guy is getting converts. In Pakistan, he says it's perverted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than in the previous hundred years of British rule. They have perverted, converted more Bangladeshis into Christianity since independence than in the previous hundred years of British rule. Indonesia, they said 25% of Indonesia is already converted to Christianity. And by the turn of the century, they want to make Indonesia a Christian nation. And there are every signs they'll succeed. At the beginning of the century, Africa was 3% Christian. Today, there are 40% Christians in Africa. 40! from 3 to 40. And by the turn of this century, they're going to make Africa a Christian continent. And by every science they'll succeed. Reason. How is it that you're not getting converts? And that other guy's getting converts? What's the reason? Come, come, my children. Tell me. What's the reason? Hmm? We are not armed. No. You're not opening your mouth. You got to talk. Any bloody rubbish you can sell. If you keep a hamari beer bahad mithe, you know that boar, very sweet, very, a bloody sourest thing, but you say bahad mithe, some fool will buy. Hmm? You keep on saying, you know, guys caught me with leeches this season. <laughs> I said it's very green. It was towards the tail end of the season. 
He said, but sir, it was growing under shade. <laughs> so I said, taste it, taste it. I said, it was not fasting, man. Taste it. I said, with that conviction, taste it, man, taste it. I said, it's okay, <laughs> give me two bunches. <laughs> I went to sour like anything. <laughs> the guy caught me. Taste it. You know that conviction, taste it, man. Uncle, <laughs> taste it free. <laughs> I said, okay, <laughs> how much? <laughs> This is it. You sell. The Christian is selling. He's knocking at your door. We, not even our neighbors, our fellow workers, we don't talk at all. We mind our own business. And the best of us will tell us, Hamara Tikana Nehe. We are not perfect. I'm asking, when will you be perfect? Look at There's three there out of four. They've got beards. And everybody's got a small goatee, like me. So they say, Look at me. Make me standard size, man. Huh? What are you wearing this Nasara clothes? You know, wear a nice jubba. You know? Be a real Islamic fellow. You had done so much, Mr. D. That, you know. <laughs> busy, busy, busy. What's that? They're keeping us busy. In the masjid. Wars, wars. Salami or no salami? War. Dua. To read loudly or silently? War. To lift up the hand or not? War. Keeping us busy when the Christian is stealing our children. You are busy with your beard and the mustache. He says, This mustache of yours, one fellow told me at one stage. I had the beard and mustache. I think I had shaven it. You see? So he asked him, You have shaven your mustache? mustache? I said, Yes. He said, You see, our Nabi said, You must trim your mustache. You know, you can't trim with a razor blade. You see? You must trim it. At least, you know, I had the beard, so not good enough. You, your mustache you had shaved. You see, you must trim it. That means still some little crop must be visible. That is there. Not, not cleaned up like a lady. <laughs> busy, busy, busy. Well, the Christian is stealing our children. He says, my brothers and sisters, arm yourself. Man. Arm yourself. Now, get back to page 13. Get back to page 13 in your book, Combat Kit. Page 13 of Combat Kit. Page 13 of Combat Kit. All right, 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 page 13, the first item A, we had marked it page 15, right, P15, the second item B, mark it, page 32, was it, uh, mark it P32, there, there in your combat kit, mark it there, you see, P32. And on the next page, on the, on the top also, mark it, P32. C, on the side, C, mark it, page 35. Right, mark it on the side, page 35. So it makes quicker reference, you see, page 35. At C, mark it, page 35. At D, D, mark it 288, mark it 288 at D, and you'll find this, the reference is not given there at the bottom. Raped her, you see you got the word raped her, the reference is not given. So you write it there at the bottom, you know, of D, bottom of D, and raped her, you mark it, write it there to S A M U E L Samuel to Samuel thirteen five to fourteen. You write this down at the bottom because the printer had missed it out in your book. That's right. Mark it at the bottom there. That the reference there is two Samuels. Two Samuel. Two Samuel. Chapter 13, verses 5 to 14. Now the next one, E. Next one, E. Mark it, page 292. Two ninety-two. P 
page 15, page 15 of our combat kit, D. Somebody will read D for me, brother. You read D loudly. D. He took hold of her. Huh? Huh? Etama uh, insisted not to be confused with Tama in C above uh -huh. and said unto her, Come lie with me, have sex with me, my sister. Uh -huh. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, come on. Amnon, Amnon is the name, huh? One of the sons of David, the man after God's own heart, do not force me. That's what she said, huh? But he would not listen to her. And since he was stronger than she was, he overpowered her and raped her. His sister. His sister. Ha, ha, ha. One of the sons of Dawud alayhi salam. He goes and rapes his sister. It's worth reading all those verses. 2 Samuel chapter 13, 5 to 14. Read it in your spare time and circle it at home. You see? How the brother seduces his sister and what pretenses, how he's showing you, giving you ideas. That guy, he loves his sister. So his friend gives him advice. He says, what you do? You feign sickness. Pretend that you're sick. You're not well. So when your father comes visiting you, he says, uh, what's wrong, my son? I'm known. He said, Daddy, he says, I'm not too well. But you know, I love to eat that samosa that my sister makes, the cookies. You know, my sister Tamar. I love it from her hands. I like to see her baking it in front of my eyes and then feeding me. Well, the father says, well, my son is sick. He's feigning sickness. So he tells his daughter Tamar, say, look, my darling, go. Make that samosa, special samosas for your brother, the meat pies that you usually make, those nice ones. You know. So she makes it and she brings it. So the sick man, sick brother, he said, all the male workers in the house, get out. So she, she is left alone with him. So he closes the door and he rapes his sister. Huh? Brother raping sister is there in the book of God. Then you go further on, page 292, write down the E, 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 see E, mark it there, page 292, at E, on page 15, E, mark it there on the side, page 292. Page 292. Just mark it there at E, P292. Yes, my sister, you read it. You read it, yes. Yes, yes, yes. E, read it aloud. So you set up the tent for Absalom, another son of David, uh -huh. and in the sight of everyone, Absalom went in and had intercourse with his father's concubine. Right, right. That will be at page 292, it will be found in, the, in your book. Absalom is another son of Dawud alayhi salam. It's a famous. This book says that Dawud alayhi salam committed adultery with Uriah's wife. Father starts it. And he had the husband of the woman murdered. A murderer and an adulterer. Dawud alayhi salam. Astaghfirullah. We believe that every prophet of God is masoom, is sinless. Lut alayhi salam, there's a committed incest. Dawud alayhi salam committed adultery and got that man killed. He's a murderer and an adulterer. Now his sons following in the footsteps. One son, he goes and rapes his sister. And another son, in the absence of the father, he puts a flat, uh, on the flat roof of the palace, he puts up a tent so the son doesn't get him. And he lines up 14 of his father's wives, call them concubines, 14 of his father's wives, and he rapes them all, one by one. Now gang rape is one woman and half a dozen men, but this is one man doing it to a 14 women, 14 of his mothers, shh, 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 14, he did it to them. What's the moral of this book? Huh? Brother raping sister, son raping his mothers, committing incest with them, wholesale, wholesale, not retail, wholesale. And God doesn't say one word. He didn't say one word to Lot. He didn't say one word to Reuben. He didn't say one word to Judah. Nothing, nothing. He's silent. He's silent like a church mouse. God is silent. Is this the book of God? Can this be the book of God? But with this rubbish, with this crap, he's getting converts. And you and I, we are not getting converts. We are sitting ducks, sitting targets for the Christians. He's making use of us as a punching bag, as a doormat. Uh -huh. And we enjoy the role. And if Didat talks, he says, Didat is talking too harsh, he's too strong. 
right? You have your way. Show me what way you have got. How do you handle this? The enemy who comes along and says, what does your Quran say? Sister, uh -huh. come and answer. He says, this book, Muhammad brought this Quran, is not the book of God. Muhammad copied this from the Jews and the Christians. He spread his religion at the point of the sword. He has so many wives. <laughs> How can he be a prophet? They say, hey, Solomon the wise had 1,000. And he's a son of God in the Bible. He can be a son of God. Very honorable title. Huh? Man with 1,000 wives. Muhammad, how many? 10, 11, 12, 13, how many? Does that disqualify him? When Solomon, David, how many did he have? 14. That doesn't disqualify him. Being the man after God's own heart, it disqualifies Muhammad. So the thing is, you've got to talk to him on his level. Turn the tables. Whatever he says, turn the tables. If you can't do that, you are a sitting duck, sitting target for that man's attacks. Right. Now, Turn to page 5 of your combat kit. Page 5 of your combat kit. Page 5 of your combat kit. Uh, by the way, while we were talking, my assistant had the foresight to go and look up in the dictionary the word concubine. And this is what he found. Concubine is a noun, number first meaning in polygamous societies, a secondary wife. Two, a woman who cohabits with a man, especially formerly the mistress of a king, nobleman, etc. C, concubina, concubina, to lie together, concubine, concubine. No, it means the same thing. That's a man, uh, you're, according to your system, we are allowed of the four wives. Right? So the guy will say that one is a a reputed wife of yours and the others are concubines but in the sight of Allah and the sight of society if you legally marry those women they are your wives but the law says no they are not your wives you can only have one wife by law all these others are your concubines call it what you like but the fact is that she is your wife if you are legally married right so page five page five at a a, you draw, take up an arrow and put down page 143-44 from a talking ass, a talking donkey in the book of God, a donkey that talks. See, a talking donkey, a talking ass. Take up an arrow from A, take it up like this here and put down page 143 stroke 4, 143 and 4, you'll find a talking donkey in the Bible, a donkey that talks. It argues with his master. What are you hitting me for? The donkey says, you know, I was working for you for so long, so honestly, why you hit me? <laughs> Talking donkey. Got it? Pages 143, 44 in your Bibles. If you have another Bible, you'll have to check up the reference and then put the paper. Put the reference. But all the Bibles that you have is this pages here. They're already provided for you. You don't have to start fumbling for chapters and verses. The second item, B, Circle it. Circle it like this. Look at this. Circle it. Four-footed fowls. Four-footed fowls. Circle it. And have an arrow going up. Have an arrow going up and say page 98. A chicken with four legs. In the book of God. God inspired it. His chickens, some of them had four legs. Chicken with four legs. Four-footed fowls. Have you seen one? Have you heard of one? A chicken with four legs. It must be a cow. <laughs> uh, C. Take an arrow out. C. Take an arrow out. Page 99. C. Birth of females, a double pollution. See? C. Page 99. See how I've done it? C. 99. Birth of females, a double pollution. The law coming from God. That if a woman bears a child, if the child is a boy, she's impure for seven days. Seven days. She's impure. And for another 33 days. Another process of purification. 33. But when you, my daughters, were born, your mothers were impure for 14 days. And 62, 64 days, 64 days, they were impure. 
Double pollution. You were a double curse on your mothers. All of you. According to the Holy Bible. You were a double curse. I says, physiologically, what is the difference between the birth, the baby, carrying of a baby boy or a baby girl? What's the difference? Hmm? Can God be the inspirer of this law? No. That for you, women, now they, they always talk about women, women, you know, in Islam, I say, hey, your God Almighty victimized you from the very birth, man. You woman, you're talking? You are a double curse on your mother. So what you mean? So, if your brother is born to your mother, she would be impure for seven days, but for you, fourteen days. <laughs> that means you are a double filth, filth and rubbish, you. <laughs> according to your book of God. <laughs> right. D. D. Circle it. D. Shamgar kills 600 with an ox goad. And arrow coming out from the circle. Page 223. Page 223. Circle that. Shamgar kills 600 with an ox goad. This champion Jew. This Jew. With a stick. With a stick with a small nail in front of it. They call it an ox goad. They use it for goading the ox. And when the poor thing is going slow, they prod it. They call it an ox goad. In Gujarati, it's a parani. I have seen it being used in India. You know, when the ox is going, you give it a prod with a small nail. Call an ox goad. Goading the ox. No. With that stick, with that print and needle there, he killed 600 Palestinians. Can you imagine? 600 Palestinians. And they were all waiting in a queue. So here, 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 here at the temple, temple, you know? Can you imagine? 600, to kill 600 Jews, or Palestinians with an ox goat. And they all waited. I see if they all, all spat on him, the guy would have suffocated. They would have suffocated the guy. But they just waited 600. Okay, come, come, come. Ahlan was Ahlan. Ahlan was Ahlan. <laughs> That's the book of God. So, he, one Jew killed 600. Mm, 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 mm. 600, yeah? Can you imagine 600 times? <laughs> Then E, E, have an arrow coming out, page 236. Page 236, E, it says Samson kills a thousand Palestinians with the jawbone of a donkey. A donkey jawbone. You know, uh, the jawbone. With that. Uh, uh, One thousand Palestinians he killed, and the thousand Palestinians they waited. Huh? You believe that? Thousand Palestinians they waited to be killed by this Jew. Thousand times, and it's just one hit he killed. Can you imagine killing a guy with a jawbone of a donkey? Man, you got to smash the guy. You know? But one thousand, and they all waited. They all waited in a queue. Huh? God, God revealing such nonsense. So. F, circle F, circle F. A seven-headed leopard. A leopard with seven heads. Page 1071. Have an arrow coming out. Page 1071. 1071. This leopard had seven heads. And on every head, ten horns. And on every horn, ten crowns. Count, count, count. One leopard with seven heads, like the Hindu gods, you know, with a hundred heads, and with a thousand hands. You have seen pictures like that? Yes. Now what they're trying to tell you? They're literal. They said God Almighty is all knowing. But they said now one head, how much can you have? How much can you hold? So they give him a hundred heads. Right? That's just trying to be literal. Said, Look, one God with one head, man, how much can you hold of knowledge? So we give him a hundred heads. He is almighty, he can do whatever he can pleases. Two hands? No. So you give him a thousand. They're literal. This is his almighty, he can do everything, but, but only two hands, how much can you do? So you give him a thousand hands. But a leopard with seven heads and ten ten horns on each head and ten ten crowns on each, each horn, that beats a lot in the Bible. The Bible beats a lot. Next one, G, G, page 353 and 633. G. Page 353 and 63. You'll find it there. To eat shit and drink piss. To eat shit. God Almighty is instructing his prophets to eat shit and drink piss. You read it there. It's in the book of God. Eating shit 
They call it human dung. See? There's no such thing as human dung, human excreta. Shit. But they want to use it, make it sound nice, you know, say so cow dung. You know cow dung? So it's not as smelly as human dung. <laughs> so this is human dung. So it sounds like less smelly. Next one. H. Circle it. Page 813. H. Circle it. Dung on your faces. Shit on your faces. Platter you with shit on your faces. In the book of God, God is talking. Plastering you with shit on your faces. Lepede tamaros, monopos, shit on your faces. Plaster you with shit. This is God's law. I, to eat cake with shit. Page 716. Fresh, fresh, the Bible says it must be fresh that come out in your sight. You must see that shit coming out and you know fresh, fresh shit and you make barley bread with that. Mix with that, with barley bread, and you eat it, telling his prophet. So the prophet says his cries to God, Oh my Lord, in my life I never had any filthy, dirty thing like this. So alright, now when instead of human dung, make it cow dung. <laughs> so, so he, he read this. Huh? How did all this come about in the Bible? That's what you have to ask the Christian. How does this all come about? In the book of God. Do you have to ask him? This is not the book of God. All the bloody rubbish things that they've written, they put it into a book, a volume, and they call it the Holy Bible. And they push it down your throat and you allow it. No, no, no. These guys, when you talk to them, you show them as if they had seen it for the first time. See, they all they are like one word, one word religion. Jehovah's Witness. He tends to take what Jehovah, 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 Jehovah. He creates a religion. Seventh day Adventist. When is the Sabbath? Saturday or Sunday? It's a Saturday. So he makes a religion out of that. Seventh day Adventist. Baptist, Baptist, baptism. Whole immersion or sprinkling. He creates a religion. These are all one word religion. One sentence, the guy takes it and he makes a religion out of it and he gets, catches converts. So Jesus said, I and my father are one. Finish. He says that. Says, Jesus said, I and my father are one. So he's God. He says, he that has seen me has seen the father. So he's made a religion out of that. He has seen me has seen the father. It means I'm God. He's the father. His own father. He went into his mother's womb and he came out. His own father. Father goes in and comes out as son. What the hell are you talking about? So I said, you see, at times, all your philosophy and psychology, it doesn't work. But one smile from your face can do the job. One smile. You know, you just smile. Jesus Christ is God. He said, yes. Your Bible said he was circumcised on the eighth day. Huh? You know what circumcision? He said, yes. So are you circumcised? He says, no. So what the hell do you know what is circumcision? It's only a word you have heard. <laughs> Circum means right round and size means to cut. What? The foreskin. But you can't circumcise the child with your mouth. You've got to hold the little child by his tool, put a bamboo splint, the good old days, and chop off the skin. Somebody had to do it to your God. Jesus. He was God. Yeah. Somebody had to hold him by his little tool and chop off the skin. Your God. His skin is lying somewhere in Palestine. Go and look it up. Search for it. He must be still there. God's skin, foreskin, lying somewhere there, in Palestine. What did they do with it? <laughs> what did they do with it? So, one smile. God, he's God. A woman carried him for nine months. Huh? Huh? Suppose you are a nurse in this table, helping Mary. And she's laboring with a helpless little creature with all the filth and the muck like every one of us. He's coming out of his mother's womb. Is he your God? Can you for one moment think that's your God? Huh? This helpless little creature, you can just hold him like that and strangle him. Your God. Did he make his own mother? This, 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 this God. You say he's your God. Did he make his mother? Did he make his grandmother? Did he make the sun, the moon, and the stars? What are you talking about, sister? What are you talking about? <laughs> One laugh. All your philosophy and psychology and theology, what you can't do, you can do it with a smile. What are you talking, sister? <laughs> your God, your second size, and they, they, Mary carried him for nine months, like you and me. Carried God for nine months? What was he eating inside there? Huh? The woman stops menstruating. He gets channeled into the navel, into the child system. God was eating that? The menses? What are you talking about? <laughs> Sister, what are you talking about? All your philosophy and psychology and theology, what you can't do, you can do it with a laugh. So some say, no, 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 you mustn't make a mockery. You're not making mockery. This is what he says. Allah bari ta'ala, he tells you that. He tells you, he uses the same psychology. Sammal Masih ibn Maryama illa Rasul. Masih, Messiah, Christ. 
the son of Mary is no more than a messenger. Kathalat min kablihi rusul, many were the messengers that passed away before him. Wa ummuhu siddika, and his mother was a virtuous woman, a noble woman, a saintly woman. Kana yakulani tam, and they both ate food. So what's wonderful about that? We all eat food. So no, since we say he's God, his mother is a goddess, they worship her in the Roman Catholic Church as the mother of God, they both ate food. Unzur! Kana yakulani tam, and they both ate food. Unzur! See how we make our science clear to you, Allah is telling you, how simple we are making it for you. They both had food. Kana yakulanit. Unzur, see, have a look. How we are making things so easy for you. Summanzur, have another look. Anna yufikun, how they have drifted away from the path. See, have another look. What? What? He's telling you they both had food, they had the call of nature, they had their shattered. Allah doesn't use that language, that they are, see, have another look. Look what? What is there to look? They both had food. So what is there to see? Another look. Allah says, have another look. What another look? He's telling you they had and shitted. God, your God, eating and shitting, a shitting God and an eating God. That's what he's telling you. But he's using the most, he's sublime, he's using a sublime language. But now coming down to our common terms, he said, look, he's see, look, and have another look. What? Okay, they used to eat and shit. They used to eat and shit. Allah is using this sarcasm. See, Allah has begotten a son. Say, Anna yakunu li waladun lam takun lu sahiba. Say, how can he have a son who's got no wife? Has he got a wife? No. So, talk to him. Say, has he got a wife? He says, no. Then how can you have a son? Huh? You have a son without having a wife? Maybe a bastard child of yours. <laughs> Not your child, is it? Come on, man. So, this is the system Allah gives you in the Quran. Argue and reason with them. But you are too saintly. So saintly that the guy is making a mess of you. Left, right and center. You have to come down to earth sometimes. Come down to his level. And give him below the belt. He's giving you below the belt. Right. Huh? The people who read the Bible can they question the Shh. So when you raise a question like that, you say, you got the devil, Mary. Mary, you got the devil. You better be, you better be, on, better be on guard. You know, says, the devil has got you. <laughs> 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 right, the last item here. Samson, circle it, Samson has sex with a whore in Gaza. Page 236. Samson uh, has sex with a whore. With a whore, the hookah, a prostitute. Page 236. It is the book of Judges, chapter 16, verse 1. It says, And Samson went to Gaza, a hero of the Jews. Samson. He's a godly person, and he's a hero of the Jews. Samson. Samson and Delilah. I don't know whether you saw the film. I saw it many years ago. It was quite a good film. Samson and Delilah. So he sees a whore, a prostitute. A hookah in Gaza and he goes in unto her. That's all. That's all. Finish. 16, chapter 16, verse 1. And he goes in unto her. He has sex with her. That's all. What does God say to that? Nothing. What anybody says? The children of Israel. The learned. Nothing, nothing. He went in unto her. <laughs> Book of God. What's the moral of that? He saw a whore and he saw and he went in unto her. Full stop. Finish. And the subject changes. Verse 2 talks about something else. What did God say to that? Nothing. What's the moral? What's the moral? Now we end with page 8. Get on to page 8. Page 8. Page 8. Item 10. Under God. Qualities ill befitting God. Not, dis not fitting. Allah, A, 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 see the arrow coming out from A and make a big circle there and put down page 612, 614 and 810. Pages 612, 614 and 810. Say from A, 
arrow coming out, 612, 614, 810. So you don't have to look up all these references. I make it easy for you to find it. It speaks about a hissing God. It speaks about a hissing God. The lions roar. The cats, mew, mew. The cows, moo. The dogs, ba. Who hisses? Snake. Snakes. Snake. God hisses. For the fly, he calls from the end of the A God who hisses. Three times in the Bible, they describe God as a hissing God. He hisses. He hisses for people. Huh? When you whistle for somebody, now they say in the new modern Bible, it say, you whistle. You're coming down to that guy's level, man. You whistle to that guy's level. That loaf around the corner, you, sh 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 so you come down to his level. God coming down to your level. He's hissing. He's a hissing God. Next one. B. He's a roaring God. He roars like a lion. To frighten you. Pages. 638, 678. 638, 678. A roaring God. Next one. A barber God. Hajam, hajam. A barber God. Page 614. He is a barber God. Hajam, hajam. God is a barber. When you open that verse, it will show you there. That he says, I will shit with a hired razor, not his own to poach up. He can't even afford to have a razor. He on a, with a hired razor, he's going to shave the hair on your head and your beards and the hair on your legs. God does it. He'll clean your legs too, for you. God, God. He's going to shave your head with a hired razor and the beard and the hair on your legs. He doesn't say how high he's going to arrive, how high he's going to reach. To clean you up. God. Hajamat karega, hajamat. And no hajam does that. In India, Pakistan, you see, we take unfair advantage of the barbers. I've seen it as a young boy in India. I was born in India. So the, the old man is sitting there, he's having his hair shaved and trim his beard. And then he lifts up his arms, he says, remove the. He does that. He pays your nails. He's the barber. He's, he's made to do all sorts of filthy, dirty, menial things. We take full advantage of the barber because hajam, hajam is low down, poach. Unfortunate. Today we call them hairdressers or tonsorial, tonsorial artists. artists. <laughs> don't, say, don't call a guy a barber or a hajam. <laughs> You'll get offended. But we call them hajams there. Remove the hair from under your arms. But no barber ever shaves your legs. But God will do that. God will do that for you. He'll shave your legs as well. You don't need wheat. No wheat required. D. Circle it. Circle it. D. He's a penitent God. Page 5 and page 669. First time he repents is on page 5 of the Bible. And the next place he repents is 669. You know, he made man. For this man. Now, he told, put him in the garden. Tell him not to eat of the tree and he knew he was going to eat and there's nothing he can do about it poor God so he had to kick him out of the garden and now still he can't purify the guy so he curses him in the world he must sweat for his bread and the wife must pay, bear children in pain and suffering labor still not satisfied then he curses all his children all his children he curses them that they all must die for the sins of Adam's original sin for what Adam and Eve did, everybody goes to hell. I'm asking the Christian. I said, look, did Adam ask you before eating the apple? He says, no. Did Eve ask your wife? He says, no. So how can God hold you responsible? Come, come, man. Think. How can God hold you responsible for a thing that you were not consulted? If you were asked, your ruh. I said, look, my son, shall I eat this? He said, well, daddy, you know, <laughs> give it a fling. Maybe partly you are responsible <laughs> for encouraging the old man. But you were not consulted. And you're going to go to hell for that? Five billion people on earth, everybody goes to hell. And now, the same God, he must come down to earth, live in a woman's womb for nine months, and at the age of 30, he get crucified to wash away that sin. What a poor thing. What a horrible thing he had to do. So, he's making toba, toba, toba for making man. Then it, a 
Astaghfirullah, <laughs> what did I do? Making this bloody monster, Frankenstein monster for you. Now I have to go and live in a woman's womb for nine months and come out through the same filthy hole, get circumcised. And now at the age of 33, go and get crucified. God, God, God got crucified. So he's repenting. <laughs> I wish I hadn't made this bloody monster, Adam and Eve. He's penitent. Astaghfar karta hai. Allah toba kar hai tumse. He's fed up with you, tired of you. Making toba toba. A god, page 299, riding a shirub, 299, page 299, he's riding a shirub. You know what's a shirub? An angel, you go to the art gallery, the urban museum complex, you'll find a beautiful painting there of a beautiful woman with wings. And she's got a wand in her hand, a stick, and she's directing the devil to go to hell. And you see the fire in the distance, in the picture, you can see all that, fire in the distance, and the devil is flying off. He's got sharp ears, horns, has got a tail with a barbed hook, the devil. But this woman, angel, is a beautiful woman, about 25, 30, that age group, the body. You can make her, she's about a woman, mature woman. But God is not riding that. He's riding a chiru, a 12-year-old. A 12-year-old angel is a crisp, 14-year-old, chiru, chiru. Kumli Kumli. He's riding her. Like in a helicopter. Huh? The Superman. You know, he does it like that. Huh? So God is riding her. A churub. In the Bible. He's riding a young thing. 12 year old. 14 year old. I've seen them in the Vatican. Shh. Made in marble. These young churubs. Beautiful things. Absolutely naked. Absolutely naked. Marble. Fresh colored marble. And everybody that passes by, he fondles their buttocks. And you can see a sheen, shine, on the buttocks of these cherubs. They are there in the St. Peter's in Rome. The holiest of holies in Christendom in Rome is there. The cherub, young Christ, young angels. Not 25, 30, mm -hmm, just too old. But God writes something nice and young, crisp. God writing cherubs. How? On, that, on, on, on her back or on her stomach? How does she fly? The breaststroke? Or does she, how, how does she fly? Huh? And God is riding her. This is the book of God. God's inspiring that rubbish. That he writes cherubs. Little young crisp things. <laughs> she didn't wait for a woman of 30. <laughs> 12 year old. Right. This is the last item. F. Circle it. Circle it. And page 252. Circle it. A God who murders 50,070 persons for looking into a box. For looking into a box. It Maybe it's a very holy box. You are not supposed to look inside. So, he's given you warning. Anybody who looks inside the box, I'll kill him. But he allows 50,070 people to pass. You know if the Queen of England dies, and we want to pass her, pay respects to her, and see her in the coffin, 50,070 will take weeks. It will take weeks for 50,000 people to pass that box. Do you know that? It will take weeks, 50,000 people in a queue, to look inside the box at the Queen's face. It will take you weeks. And God Almighty is waiting. One, two, three, thousand. 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, 50,000, and 1, 2, 50, 60, 65, 69. And then he kills them all. That's the loving father in heaven. You see, he's a loving father. The God of Islam is a tyrant. He's a merciless God. Allah says to the contrary. He's Rahman, Rahim, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. But he said, no, he is a merciless God. See, he punishes whom he pleases. My God is a loving father in heaven. I said, this loving father allowed 50,070 people to pass a box. If you are that loving father, your children, the first one who made the mistake, hey you, come, come, come here. Sorry, daddy, sorry, sorry, mom. sorry mama, you know, I won't do it again. Finish. You save 50,016. If you kill that one too, 50,016 and you save 50,000. But no, he allowed them all to pass and he killed them all 
So some 50,000 women are widowed and some 100,000 children are orphaned for looking into a box. Very kind and merciful God, very loving Father in heaven. So the thing is turn the tables. Once you have these facts, and you, the guy talks about a loving, I said, what a loving father? I said, come, come on, open your book. He killed 50,000 and 70 people for looking into a box. You do a thing like that? Huh? Even to rats, you don't do that. To cats, you don't do that. You know? So you're going to allow them all to do, make that sin, and then wipe them out? You do things like that. You're a sadist, man. You know, you get pleasure. Astaghfirullah. But with this book, that guy is getting converts. And you and I, we are not doing our job. We are not opening our mouths. This is here an inoculation I have given you. That you can become a, a bloody rubbish woman. And you become a bloody rotter. And a dirt and a bloody cutthroat and a rogue. But you are not likely to become a Christian. Ah, for money's sake or for woman's sake, yes. But on the merits of the book, you are not likely to become a Christian. That's all. That's the inoculation I have given you. Injection. To save you from being Christianized. That's all. But the others, you have to do the homework yourself. Any questions? Any questions? Is this the book they carry around? This is the book. Basically, all the Bibles are the same. There might be a difference in the terminology, the language. It says, uh, lie with him, the other one says, have sex with him, but meaning the same thing. Basically, what is in this Bible is in every Bible on earth. So, you give the reference. They can't open up. Samuel, 2 Samuel, chapter 13, verses 5 to 14. Read. Make them to read. You mustn't read. Make them to read. And they're not going to read. Say, what's wrong? Isn't that the book of God? Say, I said, what are you ashamed to read it for? Huh? Read it, man. I want to hear. From your mouth. And see how he tries to wrangle out of it. Yes. It's advice that our sisters don't have to get into an argument with the male missionaries. Right, right. Yes, right yes, yes, yes. True, 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 true. You see, these males come along, men, men come along. Now it's very, very difficult for you to get into this mess with the man about Lord committing incest with his daughters, son with his mother, brother with his sister, son with his mothers. It's not befitting. It's not befitting. So when a male is coming along, if says, look, if your brother is there or your husband is there, let him do the talking. Train him as well. Tell him, say, look, this is what, come on, man. Fit yourself, equip yourself. But uh, the other guy comes along, and we haven't got somebody there, say, hey, look, you bring your mother along. You send your mother to me, send your sister to me or your wife. I want to talk to her. Go. I don't want to talk to you. See, it's time for business. They come in peace. Right, right. So right, so you get out. Tell that guy, say, you, you get out, I want to talk to your wife. I want to talk to her, I want to ask her. You go and sit outside. Sit outside. I want to talk to your wife. I want to know whether this is the book of God. Huh? You read this to your daughters. About the daughters having sex with the father. Wanting an honorable thing to do to have sex, children from the father. What is the moral? You're going to tell this to your daughters. This book, the book on, on incest. If I were to write a textbook and give it, present it to your daughter, will you be happy? Huh? From the book of God, the types and types of incest that you can commit, I want to present it to your daughter. Your 14 year old, your 16 year old daughter, what will you do? Kai says, I'll strangle you. I said, you have a right to do that. Why? It's pornography. In the book of God? So what? Come, open, see. Yes. Right. Uh, these tubes with the pens should be left behind. Yes. So, if I may, on behalf of the people that are present here, I want to take this uh, opportunity of thanking you for the, the manner in which you presented your your argument and gave us this ammunition, this combat kit. May Allah Allah guide you and keep you long life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Some other day, inshallah, we might have the opportunity of general discussion and talk we can have. But this has to be restricted to this, to arm you. Just one question. Yes. yes. One of the students was confronted by one of the students in school, and the student was caught out. The, the student wanted to know why is it that non Muslims are not allowed in the Kaaba, in the Arab Sharif. And uh, the student gave a reply that it's the Quranic law. But uh, the student couldn't expound further and say, 
why this law was there? Maybe if you could enlighten me, enlighten us. Yes. You see, have you, I always find shortcuts. To answer. You start going into details. For example, you say, look, you people are unclean. You don't wash your backside. You are all bloody pig eaters. You are all adulterers. And all that is offensive. It may be true, but it's not called for. You see, uh, Allah gives you opportunities, and he gave me the opportunity when I debated with Swagat. Swagat posed that question. He said, we allow you to come into America, why won't they allow us to go to Mecca and Medina? I want to appear on TV in Saudi Arabia. He wants to get, get there. So I told him, look, Mecca and Medina are not in my hands. I'm not ruling that country. But to get into Mecca and Medina is the easiest thing in the world. It's the most easiest country in the world to get into. <laughs> it's amazing to hear that. We think it's the hardest country to get into. I said, you see, you say with your lips, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And visa is granted. That's all. Which means that there is no other object of worship. But Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Then they won't ask you whether you come from Eskimo land or from Mars or Jupiter. You just say, La ilaha, that you are a Muslim, that's all. I said, you just say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And visa is granted. Now just those words, that sentence. Brought for my IPC, three million and three hundred thousand dollars from one man alone. Just that statement. That statement, I just I say, easiest thing in the world, because they are always asking the Arabs, why don't they allow us into your country? You come along here, you enjoy our sisters, and some of you sodomize our boys, damn it all, and now you don't allow us to go to your holy place, we want to go there. What's the answer? The answer is, you don't wash your backside. You like this, you like that, you're bloody pig eaters, so we will bring the bloody pigs and come, and you know, we don't carry shit wherever we go, you know, we seem to be all right, and when you go out with my sister, damn it all, the shit doesn't come in your way. What the hell are you talking about? The students, students. They don't know how to answer. So, Dida says, very easy, the easiest thing in the world, the easiest country in the world to get into. Say with your mouth, man, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, so visa is granted. That man said, this is the man, this is our man, we must help him. So, the one man gave me three million and three hundred thousand dollars. Just that statement. So, he said, I find easy way. Easy way, instead of talking about all, it's in the Quran, what's in the Quran, what does the Quran say, and all that, what was the reason behind that revelation, and very easy. You want to go to Makkah Medina? Very easy. Say with your mouth, any country you get into, you need the visa requirements. Every country has got its own requirements. I want to go to Z Zambia. So, they send me a form. I want a lecture tour. They said, right, fill, a, fill the form at the back that I do not recognize the illegitimate Smith regime in Southern Rhodesia. Smith had declared the UDI. Now I'm supposed to sign this affidavit. That I do not recognize the illegitimate, that bastard Smith regime in Southern Rhodesia. I said, look, this is a battle between South and North. Why involve me? He said, look, you don't sign this, you don't come to Zambia. So I had to sign. Visa requirement. Every country has got its visa requirements. The requirements to go to Makkah Madinah? Are you Muslim? That's all. Are you Muslim? So you say with your mouth, Lai, 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 Muhammad Rasulullah, visa is granted. <laughs> so you kill all the arguments. No arguments. Musliman manjao. We are Muslim and visa is granted. Wa akhir da'wana. Alhamdulillah.